Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we learn about the other nuclear disaster of 1979. No, not Three Mile Island. The catastrophic nuclear material spill in Church Rock, Arizona. It happened only three months after Three Mile Island, but was ignored by the media and to this day even by our own movement. Activist Leona Morgan of Diné No Nukes fills us in on the impact to Native chapters, including a shocking new report that was released just last Friday, July 24th, about the current frightening threat to her people. We will also get our second lesson in social media super tricks, weekly tips on how to get the most out of your anti-nuclear online presence. This is done by Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. Plus, we'll have our regular numb nuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more honest nuclear information than PBS is bothering to put on the air this week. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, July 28, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Let's start out with an international overview of what is relatively good news within the nuclear industry, at least as far as our perspective is concerned. Japan has gone without nuclear power for a full calendar year for the first time since the first commercial nuclear power plant started up in the country 50 years ago. They are fighting against this, but we've at least got the one-year mark under our belts. Nuclear plant construction starts plunged from 15 in 2010 to 3 in 2014. There are 62 reactors under construction around the world, which is five fewer than a year ago, and at least three-quarters of these have been delayed. In 10 of the 14 countries currently building new nukes, all have projects that are delayed, often by years, and five units have been listed as under construction for over 30 years. In the film industry, this would be known as development hell, and that's where these reactors belong. Arriva, France's nuclear giant, is technically bankrupt, has been downgraded to junk by Standard & Poor's, and has seen their value share plunge to a new historic low, with more than 90% loss of value since 2007. China, Germany, and Japan three of the world's four largest economies, plus Brazil, India, Mexico, the Netherlands, and Spain, now generate more electricity from non-hydro renewables than from nuclear power. These eight countries represent more than 3 billion people, or 45% of the world's population, getting the majority of their energy needs met by genuine renewables. And in the U.K., Electricity output from renewable sources, including hydropower, overtook the output from nuclear. So that's the relative good news from World Nuclear Industry Status Report 2015. Here's the rest of the news. In an alarming full frontal attack on radiation awareness, science, and knowledge, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission may decide that exposure to ionizing radiation is beneficial, meaning radiation from nuclear bombs, power plants, depleted uranium, x-rays, and Fukushima. This wrong-headed concept is called hormesis, to which I always say, no, whoreusis, if you're backing this thing. But three different petitioners went to the NRC to say, let's change from the current standard, which states that there is no dose below which it is safe to be exposed to radiation, and that it is cumulative and never goes away from your body, to this one that says, oh, radiation is really good for you. It protects the human body. It is beneficial. To give us a clearer understanding of not only what this means, but what we can do about it, here's Diane DiRico of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, otherwise known as NEARS. 
Hi, this is Diane DeRigo with Nuclear Information and Resource Service in the Washington, D.C. area. We track the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and its proposals. In the past year, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has put out for public comment an opportunity to weigh in on changing the radiation standards that supposedly protect the country. Our organizations, hundreds of our organizations, have commented to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that any changes that they make to the radiation standards should be for greater protection. The science is showing that radiation is more harmful than previously understood. This rulemaking that the NRC is proposing or considering would actually weaken the standards for radiation protection. And what the organizations across the country have been demanding to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission repeatedly is that any changes should be in the direction of greater protection. We now know that radiation causes more cancer in women than in men at the same dose rates. So for every two men that would get cancer from a given amount of radioactivity, three women would. And the risk to baby girls getting exposure in childhood is much, much higher. Uh, so children, especially female babies, get even more cancer from uh, radiation exposures at an early age. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has a section of the Federal Code of Federal Regulations that pertains to radiation standards, and what they basically do is allow amounts of radiation to be emitted, mostly from the nuclear power and fuel chain, the whole mining and milling and making of nuclear power and waste management. So the proposed rule to change the regulations had a comment deadline, which has passed, but now there's been a petition, a couple of petitions to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by very pro-nuclear advocate doctors who want to change the basis for radiation protection. Right now, it's basically understood that increasing amounts of radiation increase a person's risk of cancer. And unfortunately, all the regulations do is look at cancer. They don't look at other health effects like potentially diabetes or heart disease or reduced immunity and greater susceptibility to other diseases. All they look at is cancer and cancer death and sometimes birth defects in the next two generations, not long term. So there is a basic scientific understanding internationally that more radiation gives greater health damage, more cancer, more cancer deaths, the more radioactivity. However, at low doses, at very low doses, radiation can be more harmful per unit dose. So scientists like to graph things, and they have a chart. So you've got an X and a Y axis. And the basic agreement among all the U.S. federal agencies, the international agencies, has been that there's a straight line from zero out into the higher numbers that increase radiation. It's a linear no threshold theory that for every amount of radiation, there's greater health effects, there's greater cancer and cancer deaths per dose. The proposal that has now come into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for public comment, and the deadline for commenting is September 8th, would throw this away. It would argue that there is some kind of safe level or that at low doses, radiation is good for you. People have probably heard this, and it's simply not true. There have been some cellular studies where for a very short time, cells might be less damaged if they have a small dose first and then a higher dose. However, if you look at the long range, any amount of radiation is harmful. I'm not trying to scare people who need to do radiation treatments or that kind of a thing, because when it's used in that way, then that's a decision individuals make. What we're talking about here is allowing the entire population, human and others, to be exposed to routine releases of radiation from the environment and to not even try to prevent it, but to claim that it's actually good for you. So what the petition now to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, it would call for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to change its basis for protection. Rather than relying on this linear no threshold model, which shows that increasing radiation is more harmful and that there's no safe dose below which there's no risk. 
the proposal would say that at low doses, the radiation might actually be good for you. Now, there are a lot of reasons why this is a very dangerous and bad idea, and the simple message, one of the simple messages is even if it were true, how would the Nuclear Regulatory Commission make sure that we only got those very safe little doses that are good for us? One, it's not true. Two, even if it was true, there's no way that it can be delivered. Like if you're in a medical situation, you get your dose distributed. If you're getting uh, radiation treatment for cancer, they direct the radiation right at the cancer. They don't give it to your whole body. So this, this is just an absolutely ridiculous and dangerous proposal, and I hope that people will barrage the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Comments need to be received by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by September 8th, and we will have a link up on the website as to how to access it and what information goes where so that your comment gets routed correctly. Because given that this is the government and given that this is nuclear, they have made it as difficult for us to comment as they can. But don't worry, you'll get all the shortcuts on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 214. Regarding reactor safety in the United States, here's the nuclear hot seat duck (coughs) and cover report. The Callaway nuclear plant in Missouri went into emergency shutdown on Thursday, July 23rd, because of an unidentified reactor coolant leak in the system that led to increased containment radiation readings. In an obvious display of semantics, the plant released word that there had been no releases from the plant above normal levels. No definition of normal, no definition of what releases did take place. And that same day, the plant was hit by a flood warning for the Missouri River until Friday afternoon. Flood stage is at 17 feet, and the river at one point was at 19.5 feet. Even as the NRC and the industry tries to convince us that nukes are perfectly safe, the Department of Health in Pennsylvania will be offering free potassium iodide tablets to Pennsylvanians who are within 10 miles of one of the state's five nuclear power plants. Whether you work or live there, you get free KI, which is only good for blocking absorption of radioactive iodine into the thyroid with a fresh radiation spill. It does nothing for any of the other radionuclides that you might be exposed to. That's a real vote of confidence in nuclear safety on the part of Pennsylvania. And the Department of Energy has awarded a nearly $5 million grant to the University of Nevada in Reno to study the seismic safety of nuclear facilities. UNR researchers are going to focus on the way that soil below a nuclear facility changes the building's behavior during an earthquake. Too bad they didn't know this before North Anna was built in Virginia and before it had its major earthquake in 2011, which exceeded design basis. And that's the Nuclear Hot Seat Duck (coughs) and cover report for this week. The Environmental Protection Agency, bastion of EPA head Gina, never met a nuke I didn't like and cover for, McCarthy, has decided to move its portable radiation lab out of Las Vegas. Not to the West Coast, where we'd really like to have some readings, but to that hotbed of radiation Not. Montgomery, Alabama. There she goes again. Gina McCarthy burying even the chance for getting honest radiation readings that might prove embarrassing to the nuclear industry. New research being circulated by miningawareness.com shows that fracking fluids become more radioactive over time. Researchers estimated that the radioactive concentration would increase by a factor of more than five within 15 days of a spill and would continue to increase for more than 100 years with the formation of decay products lead-210 and polonium-210. We'll have a link to this full report up on the website. I think you will find it of interest. Still no final word on those dead whales that were washed up in Alaska, which are being tested for radiation content in their bodies. But the state is involved with cleanup of the estimated 1.5 million tons of debris floating in the Pacific Ocean as a result of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. 
no word as to radiation levels on the debris that's being cleaned up. We just hope that those people doing the work are being given proper protection from possible radiation contamination. And a little blibbit of good news. According to a new Pew survey, most young Americans oppose offshore drilling and nuclear power. In this national survey of more than 2,000 people, 60% say climate change is real and 56% opposed nuclear power. Over to Japan, where Kyushu Electric Power Company is planning to apply to regulators to start up the Sendai-1 nuclear power facility as early as August 10th. This despite the ongoing protests of thousands and tens of thousands of Japanese people. This despite the fact that the nuclear facility is in proximity to five active volcanoes, including one only 65 kilometers, about 40 miles away, that erupted in 2014. On Tuesday, July 27, fishermen in the northern Fukushima prefecture gave Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, the green light to release radioactive groundwater from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear power facility into the ocean after it undergoes decontamination treatment. Sounds good, right? But besides the radioisotopes that are not being measured, decontamination equipment cannot remove tritium. And this permission allows for the release of tritium-contaminated water that contains up to 1,500 becquerels of cesium per liter of water. So, no bueno. Here's another sounds good but isn't story. On Tuesday, Japan approved an increase in compensation payments for the Fukushima crisis to 7.07 trillion yen, which is approximately 57.18 billion with the B dollars. But who's going to get that money? TEPCO. Yes, Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operators of the wrecked Fukushima nuclear station, will receive 950 billion yen more in public funds. And who's going to be providing those public funds, you may ask? Why, it's the taxpayers. Meanwhile, the government is going ahead with plans to revoke evacuation orders for most of the people forced from their homes by the disaster by radiation. The government wants them back in their homes and will do so by capping their compensation payouts. So the money goes to TEPCO, not to the people who need it the most. I mean, what the hell is wrong with these people? With another take on the compensation problem, in Koryama, which is in Fukushima Prefecture, cattle rancher Uino Bokujo has sued Tokyo Electric Power Company and the government to recover 500 million yen, approximately $4 million, in losses he says he suffered as a result of the 2011 nuclear disaster. Bokujo cited a drop in beef cattle prices, the inability to sell much of his beef because of radioactive contamination, the shortening of the markets because there are countries that will not allow imports of any products from the Fukushima region. Of course, the U.S. is not one of them. And also the fact that it's going to cost approximately 2 billion yen, $16 million, to dispose of the 17,000 tons of manure that have accumulated that is laced with radiation. According to an arrangement made after the accident began, TEPCO was to compensate farmers for losses incurred if they made a claim. And quite frankly, TEPCO is so fond of BS, one would expect them to buy up the entire supply of this manure. We'll let you know if they do. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, I have some serious news about Nuclear Hot Seat. Last week, when I went to post the show to the website, I could not access my own admin page. It took two separate major steps by my web hosting company, and even then, we needed an alternative online pathway in order to access my site before I could post. This is not good. Some of you may recall that about 18 months ago, NuclearHotSeat.com got hacked and taken down for the better part of a month. It still looks a little wonky, but we pieced it together and it functions. This latest problem, and a few other signs I'm not willing to discuss within the program, point to the fact that someone, somewhere, 
with a lot of online firepower does not like Nuclear Hot Seat and that I need to take steps now to protect the show's website and archive. Rather than another piecemeal fix, such as was done last time, I want to take this as an opportunity to increase the functionality, searchability, and look of the site, as well as create a Fort Knox containment structure to protect it. In order to do that, I have to raise money. Through the anti-nuclear community, I have found a good website developer who can be trusted to achieve what's needed, and he's given me what looks to be a great price. However, in order to get the work done, I need to raise just under $2,000. Yeah, I know. So if you've ever thought about donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, now would be a great time to do so. You can go to the website, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. If you prefer not to make your donation online, you can email me for an address, and I will give you some place to snail mail your donation. Know that all donations that I receive from this point forward will go specifically to a fund to cover the website charges. For as little as 500 we can get started. I just don't want to have that debt hanging over this show. Whatever you can do to help, it's really appreciated, and I thank you. Leona Morgan is a Diné advocate for clean water, focused on protecting her people and the land from uranium mining and nuclear developments in the Southwest, specifically around the Navajo Nation, plus lands within the Diné Four Sacred Mountains. Morgan has been working on these issues since 2007 and recently co-founded the initiative Diné No Nukes with the mission to keep Diné Bikiye, meaning the sacred lands of the Navajo people, nuclear-free, starting with a campaign for widespread education on the issues. Leona Morgan, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hi, Libby. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Let's start out with a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved with nuclear issues. Well, I started in 2007. I was invited to attend a meeting uh, that was regarding the sacred mountain known as Tzotzil in my language and to the greater American audience that would be Mount Taylor in New Mexico, Grants, New Mexico. So I went to this meeting and I first discovered uh, what the issues were regarding uranium mining, renewed uranium mining, and new mining on the mountain. I remembered my grandmother, uh, she died of lung cancer back in uh, the early 2000s. And for some reason, these two things just seemed related, and I wasn't exactly sure how uh, until later when I started to learn more about the, the various health impacts from the uranium boom So I uh, was pretty determined to work on this issue, knowing my grandmother had died of something that was probably caused from uranium mining. I'm certain it was. I mean, it's impossible to prove it now that she's passed, but I'm pretty certain that my grandmother was affected by the uranium industry, as was most of the folks in my family who had been, you know, victims of cancer or kidney disease. I'm pretty certain all of those are related to the past uranium mining, and so That's how I got involved was because my family had been affected and myself, I didn't grow up in a contaminated area, but the entire region uh, where I live and went to school is affected by the past mining. And so today we do have renewed interest because of the first it was the false nuclear renaissance and now we have this threat of Japan turning on its reactors and so The uranium companies are, again, becoming more present and trying to move things along. So that's where I come in today. My sympathies to you and your family for the loss of your grandmother for this uranium-related event. I would have no doubt that there's a connection as well. This is connected to the amount of uranium mining that took place on native lands, but also there have been some significant accidents, including in 1979, a major spill that took place at 
Church Rock. Tell us approximately where that is and what that accident consisted of. The accident occurred on July 16th, 1979, in the morning, which is about the same time when the Trinity blast occurred on July 16th, but in 1945. And so both of these were in New Mexico about 5.30 in the morning, very, very early. And the spill was actually only three months after Three Mile Island had occurred, yet there was really no mass media attention like there was on the accident in the East Coast. We direct the cause for these types of uh, cover-ups to be related to environmental racism or the different forms of institutionalized racism that occur in such rural communities and communities of color. So out here in New Mexico, it's a very rural residential climate. We're not a rich state. We don't have a high population. And growing up, we were often laughed or toward the end in in the rating of education in the state. So I doubt that the government and the responsible companies were paying much attention when the spill occurred, not as much to us as they were to the white communities in the East Coast. And so you often never hear about the spill or If you do, it's not to the same level uh, as you would hear about Chernobyl or any of the other huge disasters that are caused by the nuclear industry. Now, I had never heard of Church Rock except from you when we were both up at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City earlier this year when you mentioned it from the stage. But it's pretty horrifying to see what the accident consisted of. It was United Nuclear Corporation's uranium mill tailings disposal pond that was breached It released over 1,000 tons of solid radioactive mill waste and 93 million gallons of radioactive tailing solution that flowed into the Puerco River. How far did this reach into the lands of your people when the accident happened? Well, we know that the spill had gone through several Navajo chapters. We have 110 Navajo chapters within the Navajo Nation proper. And the spill went through most of them that are along the Puerco. And it's claimed to have gone at least 100 miles west into Arizona, but I'm sure it's gone much further than that. And the thing that we don't know is how deep the sediments have gone into the the water table or into the groundwater. So that's something that is still being studied today. What was the initial impact on the people who, I understand, were not warned about what this was? It was just suddenly water appearing in an otherwise dry creek bed. There is a really good film that's actually available online. I use this often for events and then also to educate as a type of primer. It's called The River That Harms. It was made by a filmmaker named Colleen Keene, and she has allowed me to use this film because it does show very vividly some of the effects to the local impacted communities. So some folks were actually in the water the morning that the spill occurred. Their sheep or their horses, their different animals, some of them were drinking the water or in the spill path. And so uh, Navajo ranchers and sheep herders had to get into the actual liquid waste and take care of their animals, meaning they actually had to pick up the sheep or, you know, chase the horses out so that they wouldn't be in the water that long. And at that time, they were not warned. They were not given, you know, the contents of that spill. And so later they had reported that the bottom of their legs, their feet were affected by different skin problems, uh, lesions. They were burned and, and the animals were also affected. So those are some of the stories that you could see in the movie, The River That Harms. And there were also reports of different effects down the road. Like I've heard anecdotal stories today about animals being born uh, with both sexes or animals that have no snout, like the sheep might have no facial structure and it looks like the nose is caved in. I've heard reports of different things, but there are some photos that I can actually email you that maybe you can post with your blog 
of a sheep that was born with, with no fur. And that sheep was born in a community called Redwater Pond Road. And it didn't live that long. But they do have documentation of that. That sheep actually is the poster child of some of the issues that I'm talking about now. And we've used that sheep as inspiration for one of our images. It's a picture of a sheep on a circular sticker. And the type on the sticker says, radiation, question mark, not in my water. That is an image the Neno Nukes is using as an educational tool. The image is based on the international nuclear power, no thanks sun image. And so we use this little sticker to show people and explain the entire history of this spill that we are talking about now. So this really simple image we use to educate folks to remind them that this happened and to bring up the topic in a more palpable manner as opposed to talking about the deformities and other effects to humans. So we can talk about these things referring to the sheep and all of the, the problems with the sheep. And then we have to further explain as Dine people, what does that mean to us when we eat the sheep or, you know, use the sheep's wool and we use the different parts of the sheep. And so this image itself can be used to explain not only the environmental justice issues, the nuclear issues, and then, you know, you can talk about energy, weapons, all of the problems with the nuclear industry but one of the more important things that I think folks are worried about is the food sovereignty issue and then also the water issue. So that people understand, the accident at Church Rock in 1979 is frequently described as having released more radioactivity than at Three Mile Island. But there has never been an epidemiological study done of the impact of this radiation spill on the Navajo people. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission actually said that by saying that there was more radioactivity than Three Mile Island released, they called that an overstatement and said that the event was more significant from an environmental perspective than from a human one, which is a statement that makes no sense, especially since studies have shown since the 1950s that the Navajo have had significantly higher rates from some cancers than the national average. But you told me earlier that there are now some new studies that are taking place. What is now being explored to try and quantify the impact of the uranium mining and the church rock spill on your people? Well, right now, uh, like you said, there are no massive comprehensive studies of the entire scale or impact that has been left from that spill. There are some studies that are focused on certain aspects of uranium contamination, not specifically this spill alone. There are some studies, such as the Navajo Birth Cohort Study and the Diné Project, that are being led by the chief investigator, Johnny Lewis, at UNM, which is the University of New Mexico. She's working with Chris Shuey, someone who has been following these issues for decades, and those are some of the more recent studies where they are actually looking at the effects to humans. And you can look on the Internet under the healthyvoices.org website for some of the data there. And I believe they just also released a YouTube video so you can go online and just Google some of these things. There's another more recent study called the Puerto River, Little Colorado River Uranium Water Quality Assessment. And they have just released some information on Friday, which is quite alarming to the local communities who are downstream from the river. And this is a project of Talani Lakes Enterprises, and they're looking specifically, this is looking at the community of Sanders, which is in Arizona. And they have found that eight water wells are contaminated with high levels of uranium, levels exceeding 30 parts per billion. There's seven unregulated wells and one regulated drinking water source. So that means one well that people are using to drink out of and for their cooking and showering and all of the normal day-to-day -day uses of water, there's an entire community that just found out on Friday at a public meeting that their water has unsafe levels of uranium in it. And so they're angry is an understatement. They're concerned. They're ready to 
do whatever they can to demand immediate attention to have access to safe drinking water. This is something that's unfolding now, and the community is getting organized, and they're looking at the various government departments. They're really upset, and so they're going after every authority that they could to make sure that they know this is something that needs attention now. And so there's a level of immediacy that I've not seen probably since the nuclear renaissance was being propagated. This is brand new information, and on Friday, the community that came together is, again, Sanders, Arizona. This area, we call it Newlands. It's pretty far from the spill, and all of the wells that I just mentioned, the seven that are exceeding the Safe Drinking Water Act levels, they are downstream from the spill. Personally, I have always known that the contamination from this spill that occurred over 36 years ago are still sitting along that stream bed. Last year, we had just kicked out a company called URI because the communities were very aware that uranium mining has impacted the local area. It has contaminated not just the water, but also the minds of some people who think that uranium mining can bring jobs and economic development. And so last year, we were successful in keeping a ISL project in situ leach mining out of the church rock area. And this is something that the community is becoming aware of because before, when the mining had ceased in the 80s, a lot of folks stopped talking about the mining, people stopped talking about the accident, yet their animals were impacted, and yet the health, you know, was being impacted, cancers were increasing and that kind of thing but people didn't talk about it that much. And so since the 2006 supposed nuclear renaissance, there has been a little bit more attention and awareness, yet the community overall is still just learning about the impacts of uranium as a natural element. What does it mean to have higher background levels just because there is uranium in the ground? Oftentimes the community is not as aware as, say, the company public relations people. And so the public relations people, you know, they have a job to do to make it sound like uranium is uh, benign. And so they're very successful at talking to elected officials and confusing them between the different types of radiation that are out there. This is exactly the line that I've been taking with nuclear hot seat, that radiation is really the battleground, because if people don't understand the impact that radiation has and the difference between external and internal contamination, meaning the equivalent of warming your hands over a campfire, which is external radiation, versus swallowing a hot coal, which is internal, which you get from drinking the water, inhaling the steam in a shower, eating food that has been contaminated, eating meat from an animal that has been grazing or drinking contaminated materials. If people don't understand the impact of radiation, they won't understand why this whole thing is so dangerous. So it's good that you and the others are stepping forward with this information, and now there has been a real jolt to awareness because we're talking about when you say last Friday, it's July 24th of 2015 that this information first came about and we are talking on the 27th. So this is hot off the presses and very fresh. Now, you are also involved with something called the Radiation Monitoring Project. Yeah, that's a project of the Nanonukes and uh, two of our other partners, the Sloths Against Nuclear State and the Nuclear Energy Information Services based in Chicago. And what does this consist of? Just like the project that I mentioned before, the Talani Lakes Enterprises, that project is something that is created by people who know that there are holes in the scientific data. And so a colleague of ours, He's a, one of the co-founders in the Nanonukes, is Tommy Rock. So Tommy Rock is the technical lead of the project I mentioned, the Porco River, Little Colorado River Water Quality Assessment. He knew from his experience that there is contamination that is not documented and is not studied. And so that's something, you know, he's working on this project with another guy named Jacques Saron. That's community-driven research. And so the same way... We identified that there are holes in the scientific data that do not connect 
uranium mining to these various cancers, and there are studies going on. But right now, the other thing we don't have is basic background levels in places that have been affected by uranium mining and places that are going to be threatened possibly by new mining or new transport of uranium ore through the Navajo Nation. And so the Radiation Monitoring Project is a community-driven initiative to create the data, not just on the Navajo Nation side, uh, we call it the front end of the nuclear fuel chain, but we want to create nationwide monitoring by community folks in places that are affected either by uranium mining or other nuclear activities such as Indian Point. Our colleague David Kraft in Chicago is living in a nuclear state, and so they're going to be doing a different type of monitoring. And so this project is not just for our area, but to establish some type of background level across the board in the various nuclear fuel chain affected communities. We will, of course, be posting links if people wish to pursue any of this information and perhaps get involved on behalf of their own communities, large or small. You have been taking a powerful position as a spokeswoman for your people, not just in your local community, but you have been branching out. Again, we most recently saw each other up in Quebec City, where you spoke at the World Uranium Symposium. Where are you focusing your attention in the coming months, and what can we, the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat, do to support you? Thanks, Libby. We're actually a brand new organization. Dinah No Nukes is going to be focusing on Navajo Nation wide education. And so I'm not the person that's coming up with all this great information all the time. I mean, I come up with uh, my own observations here and there, but really, I believe what my job is, is to translate English to English. <laughs> so something that I think is really necessary that's often overlooked is bringing that nuke speak down to a, let's say, 10th grade reading level or a place where somebody who doesn't speak English, if English isn't their first language or if this information has to be translated to elders, it's incredibly difficult to translate what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is allowing to our grandmas and grandpas because some of these words don't exist in the in the Navajo language. Some of those words don't exist in the English language. <laughs> and they do that intentionally. I mean, I find myself having to translate it down to maybe a, a first or second grade level just so that I can understand it. And only once I understand it can I convey it. So what you're doing is invaluable in terms of translating the dense gobbledygook that comes out from the NRC and elsewhere of the nuke industry into something that normal human beings can understand. Yeah, pretty much. And I don't do this alone. I mean, there's tons of resources. I have a lot of uh, supporters. And so some of the stuff that I find invaluable is the work that's coming from, for instance, the Southwest Research and Information Center. They've been working on this stuff for over three decades. And so without folks like them, and other entities like I mentioned, Tommy Rock and Talani Lakes Enterprises, without that type of work, and then there's a handful of students all over the country that are moving all kinds of research into unknown territory. There's a lot of research that's, you know, like I said, filling in the gaps, but then we have some really amazing brand new types of things that people would never even think of. Like from NAU, there's a lot of students that are doing work, and some of that is going to eventually result in standards for safe amounts of consumption of sheep organs because we eat the sheep. And so there are students out there concerned about these things and working on them, and the realistic outcome that's something that we can use are recommendations for, for example, don't eat this amount of sheep livers per year if you are grazing your sheep in a contaminated area. And so these are new things coming out because we need this kind of stuff as Navajo people, just like many indigenous people all over the world, still carry on our traditional ways. And so in different communities like up north, they're concerned about their caribou. In Greenland, they also eat sheep. They're also concerned about what will happen if their government allows uranium mining there. 
at the World Uranium Symposium, we had a meeting with the indigenous folks that came. We called it an indigenous caucus. Forty-five of us gathered, and we ate lunch together. And there was people from Africa, Australia, Saskatchewan, the United States, again, Greenland, I mentioned, uh, Mongolia. And all over the world, we have very, very, very similar concerns as it pertains to the contamination of water. So the global concern, I think, for indigenous folks that I've come to know in this work, I've been doing this for like seven years, maybe close to eight years now. And the thing we come together on is always water. It's a universal uh, sacred entity. And for us, in our language, we say, that means water is life. And so water is life. And what we know is that if our water is contaminated, you know, our lives, our livelihood, the future generations will be impacted. As indigenous people working on these issues, the concern isn't just for our lives today and the health of our people today or our sheep and the water today. We're concerned about the future generations. And so that's not just the food and the water quality, but that's also our genetic integrity and what we're passing on to, to our children and, and their children. And so some of these things, they are not known, like you said, but there are studies that are beginning to come out with the information that we need to show the elected officials who are allowing these things to stop permitting new mining, new reactors, even expanding places like Los Alamos or WIP. Globally, I think all of the indigenous people, I would say the majority of us are concerned about the water and the future. And so what that means today is how do we prevent these things from occurring if we already lived through it once? And so I think the thing that your listeners can do is to educate themselves not only on the nuclear industry, but also the links to institutionalized racism, the marginalization of Native peoples in this work. When I started doing outreach in the East Coast, when I I think I had met you in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, I was shocked to realize that some of the leading experts in the country who do work on uh, reactors and some of the most, to me, highly educated anti-nuke activists had no idea what uranium mining was. You know, this was shocking to me that there were people out there who never heard of the Church Rock spill of 1979 or didn't know there were 10,000 abandoned uranium mines across the country. And so as soon as I found out that there was this information that was not being given or exposed, I realized we need to connect, and in order to attack the nuclear monster that I mentioned, this needs to come from all of us, not just indigenous people, not just the anti-nuke activists in the East Coast, but working together, we need to understand each other's issues and each other's struggles. And so with the radiation monitoring project, this is a way to not only educate ourselves, help to educate and empower the communities, but also to foster solidarity between our work and to actually unite. Well, Leona, it's a joy to speak with you, not just because of the passion and the focus of your attention and your work on these issues, but also because you and the students who you have helped to inspire and coordinate represent a whole new generation in the anti-nuclear movement. So that those of us who have a bit of snow, shall we say, coming through in our hair, will not feel like when we go, we're leaving nothing behind. But you will be part of the next generation to grow and take this on. And for that and for all the work that you're doing, I thank you for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks, Libby. Thanks for having me. Leona Morgan of Diné No Nukes. We'll have the promised links up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 214. Next, we're happy to welcome back Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. Dave hosts Fuku Friday Happy Hour Hangout. And rather than the times that I gave you last week, he has changed them to 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific, 
every Friday for those of you who can figure out how to get to him on Google+. We will have a link up to him on the website just in case you can manage. We all need to increase our social media knowledge to keep growing the anti-nuclear movement and keep that information out in front of a more general public. To that end, Dave has come up with a series of brief lessons about social media steps we can all take. So get out a pencil, get ready to take a few notes, and here's Dave Parrish with Nuclear Hot Seat's exclusive Social Media Super Tricks number 2, SEO Smarts. Hey guys, it's Dave here from Operation Save the Earth, and this is part two of the eight-part Social Media Super Tricks series. Now, if you missed last week's episode of The Hot Seat, go back and listen to it because we went over the basics. The big numbers involve the social media across the web. This week, we take a look under the hood on how the big machine works and how we can make it work better for us. Search engine optimization, or SEO as it's commonly referred to, is a critical factor to anyone in our community that runs a website, blog, or forum. With just a few simple adjustments to your corner of the web, you can shine a spotlight on who finds you with the web's various search engines, and being found is the whole key to driving success. Some simple methods you can use to increase your SEO is to use keywords to help make your content searchable, or affiliate yourself with other sites that will link you up. If you do that, you're well on your way to being found. The reason why you want to do this is the algorithms. Those little spiders on the web that collect your data, every bit of it, and translates it into something that's searchable. So think of it this way. You want to feed the spiders what they need. That way you're not just highlighting your content. You're increasing the amount of visibility to the cause on Google. So how do you do that, you ask? It's easy. Use the super trick of the week to help your journey to better SEO. Go to www.ubersuggest, that's U-B-E-R, suggest.org. It's free. Plug in the word Fukushima and see what you get. Take the top three keywords associated and put them on your website's home title page, your tags, your comments, any place you can think of, just like virtual bumper stickers. Whether it's hashtag Fukushima or hashtag no nukes, Find the keywords that you want to be most associated with and load them up on your sites. Remember, presentation is everything on the web, just like it is in the real world, so use the power wisely. That's your super trick for the week. We'll see you next time. That was the irrepressible Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. To learn more about Dave's work against nukes and to contact him, I do have that link up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 214. This week, we are combining two features, activist shout-outs and... Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of the week. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. On Wednesday, July 29th, NOVA, the PBS science series, is premiering a new program on Fukushima called Nuclear Meltdown Disaster. Well, with a title like that, as an anti-nuclear activist, pass the popcorn. This sounds like it's going to be good, right? Hold your horses just a moment there. Don't be fooled by NOVA's promises to speak with workers who were there during the harrowing days. A direct quote from their press release And look at these quotes instead. After two weeks, the three reactors were stable. No, they were not stable. They were in ongoing meltdown circumstance. Here's another quote. Official cold shutdown condition was announced in mid-December. Well, yeah, TEPCO announced it. That doesn't make it true because it wasn't true. You can only do a cold shutdown on an intact reactor that you turn off and wait until the temperature goes down. You can't do a cold shutdown on a melted core into the groundwater wreck of a nuclear reactor. Here's another one for you. There have been no deaths or cases of radiation sickness from the nuclear accident. Oh, yeah? Tell that to Masao Yoshida, 
who was the plant manager who stayed behind and rallied the Fukushima 50, and who died less than three years later from esophageal cancer, which, of course, TEPCO said had nothing to do with Fukushima because he couldn't possibly have gotten the cancer that fast, uh, given the catastrophic amount of radiation he was exposed to. I think he could, and he did. And as for no radiation sickness, what do you want to tell those kids who, when they get a chance to leave Fukushima long enough to go someplace like Hawaii, that they wake up in the morning and there's blood on their pillowcases because of the nosebleeds they've had because their bodies have been so impacted by radiation. And NOVA had the gall to not only say in the program, but include in their press release that while there had been well over 1,000 deaths from maintaining the evacuation, in contrast, there was little risk from radiation if early return had been allowed. No! Wrong! Wrong! Listen to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hear what's going wrong on a weekly basis. This is propaganda. I guess over at PBS, they must have been taken on the carpet and been warned by their federal financial overlords that they were in danger of losing their federal funding if they didn't toe the line and get with the program of propaganda. So that's what this is. Pandora's promise under another guise. This is a piece of propaganda that we deserve to respond to at every local PBS station in the country. Contact the program department. Call them up. Complain. Get your voices heard. Because I'm telling you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. None that's out of week. And here you thought I forgot. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 28, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, World Nuclear Report, Jim Heddle of Ecological Options Network, EON3, HealFukushima.org, FederalRegister.gov, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, ABC17 in Missouri, WTAE.com, Donna Gilmore and SanOnofreSafety.org, KUNR.org, ReviewJournal.com, FuelFix.com, DailyMail.co.uk, Abalone Alliance Clearinghouse, PBS, Yahoo.com, Asahi.com, WHYY, Dr. Timothy Mousseau, Smithsonian, Journal of Ornithology, Journal of Heredity, Weather Channel, Sputnik.com, NeonNettle.com, AsahiShimbun.com, WSJ.com, Tokyo Electric Power Company, The Karmic Sellouts, who write for WorldNuclearNews.com, and the heroic anti-nuclear warriors of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our archives are available on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, or on iTunes. Our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat videos, with our thanks to Joni Ray for posting them every week. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all, really, truly, and forever, in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.